Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. I look forward to an insightful discussion with our panel of marketing experts on what's going to be needed this year to drive meaningful digital experiences and sales this holiday season. My name is Monica Deritich and I'm a retail advisor to Sail Through, a leading personalization and email platform and part of the CM Group's impressive portfolio of email marketing solutions. As a former client of Sail Through, I can attest to their ability to support the many changing dynamics in retail, especially as of late. I am here with my fellow Sail Through retail advisor, Laura Carrier, who has an extensive background in data and strategy and has worked for companies such as Macy's and Saks Fifth Avenue. I'm also joined by Jennifer Chu, marketing director at Theorem, which is a value partner firm to Sail Through. Uh, they enable customers with solutions such as supporting customer engagement, personalized email templates, and email optimizations as a whole. Uh, Jennifer, I'll hand it over to you to introduce yourself and complete the introduction of our panel today and share a bit more on how Theorem supports retail marketers. Thanks, Monica. So I'm Jennifer Chu. I work for Theorem um, as our marketing director, and we are an end-to-end -end solutions provider for companies um, across the industry, helping to support marketing, digital marketing initiatives and solutions from start to finish. Um, we're a partner with Sale Through, and we help um, execute a ton of solutions from conceptualization all the way through implementation and reporting. We are also joined by Adamola. I'm gonna let him introduce himself. Go ahead, Adamola. You can introduce yourself to everybody here. My name is Adamola. I'm an e-commerce consultant for enterprise brands. And I'm also the founder of Vagabond Cookies. I'm very excited to be here today. And it's nice to see everyone. Thank you all for being here. So we want to ensure that uh, this is a valuable event for all today and encourage you to drop in any questions, comments in the chat, and we will get to them at the end of the session. Uh, I want to dive right in, uh, if that's okay, panelists, and, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's been just over a week since Apple released their new mail privacy protection updates and with their latest iOS release. And this, of course, has been very much anticipated, very much on top of all of our minds on how this is going to impact our respective worlds and, and marketing teams. Um, so without the ability to track open events and location pixels for a likely large portion of your audiences across our respective um, market, um, retail organizations, uh, this is a question question I want to pose to the full panel, I'd like to know, what are we seeing so far? Has there been a clear line of distinction in the shifts? Um, how has this impacted the marketing ecosystem? Um, I know that there is some, a lot of, a lot of uh, impact to um, you know, performance marketing. How does that trickle down to direct marketing channels? And you know, any ways that you can suggest for our audience um, as far as new approaches um, specific to holiday as a result of what we're seeing so far. Um, I'll start with um, Jennifer. Sure, so we've seen a ton of impacts and I think a lot of what we're seeing so far is really impacting not only email marketing, but it's gonna impact advertisers as well. Um, in terms of email marketing, I think the open rate impact is gonna change a lot of the way that we're measuring KPIs as we move forward in terms of success. Um, not only for, for organizations like us, for our internal, but also for our clients. Um, there's a concern that the void of information left uh, by the policy will result in consumers getting more emails. So I think that's gonna be top of mind for a lot of us to say, okay, now that we can't really manage who's opening um, in terms of our iPhone and Apple users, how do we figure out what's a better way to measure what they're seeing and what they're not and how they're responding. And I think a big impact is going to be to smaller businesses that don't have larger marketing teams to really manage that. Um, so we, we, as a whole, as a marketing uh, universe, need to figure out a better way to manage that so that inboxes aren't getting swamped with not only duplicate emails, but also irrelevant emails because we're not really seeing what people are interacting with. Um, we're also seeing in terms of advertising, I think, especially for e-commerce and retail brands, the cost of advertising is going to go up. Um, you know, the conversion cost has gone up by 200% over the last six months. And I think iPhone users are going to get harder and harder to track. So we need to figure out 
how to leverage that and what's a better way to really hyper target people for both email and for advertising. Um, those are the things that we're really seeing. I'll kind of kick it over to Laura to kind of piggyback on what I said, but I think, you know, there's a lot to be said here. Sure. So um, one of the things, and Jennifer, I'm glad you mentioned small businesses relative to, to medium and larger size businesses is it is different depending on your what your marketing teams are able to do. But one of the things that almost everyone can do is understand how many iOS users you actually have as your baseline historically. Globally, it's around 35%, but what is that for your business? We tend to see with retailers with kind of higher socioeconomic um, consumers, a much higher rate, and then obviously ones with lower so socioeconomics, a lower rate. So this is only going to impact those users. You're still going to be able to understand your open rates across Google and other email platforms, et cetera. So taking that baseline and understanding, okay, what has it been historically? What percent of iOS users do I have? Will help you to understand, especially through this holiday period when everything's in transition, how can I decrement that rate that I've used as my baseline historically against what I'm seeing this year to be able to develop a measurement understanding of what it should be or would be if open is actually what you want to study going forward. One of the things I think this is going to do is really force um, retailers and measurement companies in general to understand what actual customer behavior leads to the KPI for your business. And the most important KPIs for any business, I'm not talking about marketing, but overall is profit. Are you seeing revenue versus cost? It's customer satisfaction. Are you delighting your customer and are you building brand equity? So of all those marketing behaviors that you're seeing or incentivizing, consumer behavior, excuse me, that you're incentivizing through your marketing, which of those, is it opens, is it clicks? Is it engagement right, rates? Is it engaged sessions? Which of those are actually leading to one of those three KPIs such that you're creating solvency in your business? Um, so that's a big one. Lower pivot your open rate goals. Look at other metrics like I just mentioned. Um, the other thing is today in today's world, we're really able to start using predictive analytics in ways that we've only wanted to do historically, but not been able to do. So instead of just looking at those diagnostic metrics, like what happened historically, start to actually look at what can I influence going forward. So if I'm sending an email to, let's say, incentivize loyalty program um, engagement or signups, and loyalty program tends to have a correlation with revenue within the next two weeks, then maybe that's something that I should prioritize over what I've looked at, you know, historically, um, just on the diagnostic rate, but not just loyalty program signups, but how much can I actually incentivize going forward in terms of re revenue. So predicting, saying, hey, if I send this, I'm gonna to contribute to $3 million in revenue. So those are three big things that I think we can do. Um, and then lastly is really talk to finance team about these KPI shifts. This should not just live in marketing. This shouldn't just be something that you guys are concerned about, but because all of your marketing dollars ultimately come from your finance teams, make sure that they are aware of the shifts that you are doing or seeing and that you're going to continue to see going forward. Wait, am I, am I supposed to follow those two great points there? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you covered mostly everything, but one thing I wanted to add as well is uh, just in terms of like email specifically, I think there's going to be a huge shift towards cleaning out email lists. So determining who's not engaged quickly oh, really? and then making sure that you're not spending your money there. So if we're shifting towards clicks and not really relying on open rates anymore, then it is really important to determine, you know, even sending out a last ditch email to say like, are you still reading these emails or not, right? And if you get a click there, then you can continue to send those segments out your emails. But if you're not getting a click there or they click no, in that case, then you know not to spend money on those customers anymore. So I think the biggest shift is the skewing of open rates, and we're going to have to adjust to that as marketers. But uh, we figured it out in the past, and we'll continue to figure it out. So I have faith that we'll find new and creative ways to make sure that this doesn't dampen our, our fun. Very well said. So I'm going to chime in and say uh, it is a great opportunity as marketers. We've been so agile the last going on two years to really, you know, pivot and pivot and pivot. Um, so we've become stronger as a result. And, and I don't think this is the end of the world. There's still so much to go off of. And it's a nice reset of focusing on what does 
what really matters and how are we delivering the ideal experiences? So yes, we may be limited to some data, but there, there are so many additional data points that show signs of life that you can do to address uh, or identify someone that is engaged with, with your brand. There, are, If you have a mobile app, that mobile app activity, you have site visits, you have redemption of loyalty rewards, um, so many sources that can be pulled in to drive segmentation strategy or, or, or sort of a, a rebuild of your engagement rules for email specifically. I think that uh, I love uh, Laura's point about, you know, communicating with finance teams. I, I think we've done a lot to break down the silos within marketing or organizations between the on-site and email marketing teams with paid media. Uh, obviously, this uh, this release uh, uh, impacts the entire marketing ecosystem, impacting um, prospecting and retargeting campaigns. I think, um, especially with a, a larger milestone looming with Google's third party, it's it's a moment for marketers to really hone in and, and review what is the first party and zero party data strategy? How are we encouraging customers to um, tell us what they want to hear? How are we building the foundations on the back end to ensure that inf- that is captured and being pulled in to inform the different platforms that we are you know, using to communicate to the customer. I think as far as holiday this year, you know, I, I think the main headline from everything that has come up leading up to the um, I, uh, Apple iOS update is, you know, shift to click, shift to engagement. We're taking it from top of funnel opens to like, okay, let's, let's go in further down the funnel, further down to conversion. How do we get them to a- engage with this more? And I think it's going to, mean a lot more pivots um, to things that we have learned in email historically. There there have been email campaigns, and this can vary based on what the objective or your KPI for email, but I'll take an example of, you know, a standard new arrivals email or, or sale campaign where the emails had evolved into being sort of mini websites that customers can use to, to browse, and maybe it's pulling some of that back to get them to the site. Email's job at the end of the day is to get people to the site or to relay information that's pertinent to actions they've taken. So I think uh, there's so much to be done and we do still have the ability to test down to the metrics that matter most, which indeed at the end of the day, not open rate, right? We need to get them to to come back and engage. And um, there are email metrics that, you know, beyond email metrics that should be the focus, which are what is that lifetime value of the customer? How, you know, their email is obviously a component. We're, we're very much in tune with email, but it would be a miss to not acknowledge that it's part of a larger integrated marketing strategy and your all these channels really support one relationship with the customer. Um, these were all really, really great uh, points of view. And I Monica, I'm just going to add one thing that you brought up about your data strategy. Um, I think it's going to be crucial for organizations of every size to start building out um, a data strategy that they communicate to their customers such that they're instilling trust in their privacy and their security going forward. Mm -hmm. Data is value. It's money nowadays. So if you want a customer to give you that money, then you need to show to them that there's a value exchange and that you're going to protect it. And I think a lot of um, smaller and mid-sized companies over the last 10 years have been able to get away without building that out. And I think going forward, all of these changes are going to um, require that, which is, a, which is a good thing. So that's another thing I would you know, consider, especially as we go into um, holiday in 2022. Right. And Sorry, Monica, I was just going to pay Laura. I'm so glad you said that because I was just going to say, I think we're going to see a large uptick in, you're right, a lot of transparent communication coming out of marketing. I think consumers are really calling for it. And another big thing that I think is going to be on the rise is um, like the all-inclusive privacy center where you're really directing people to say, here's what kind of content I want from you. Here's, you're really pushing first party data for them to say, here's my current job title and email address. Here's what I want to hear from you. I don't want 15 emails a week. I want four that are really talking about this specific topic, whether it's email marketing or whatever practices. Um, So I think, yeah, like just to piggyback on that, that's going to be a big thing that I think a lot of people are talking about 
um, just being more transparent and open and asking our consumers to tell them what, tell us what they want so that we can fulfill their needs and really add value, which is the whole purpose of creating not only like a first party data strategy, but a first party relationship building strategy, which is kind of taking a lot of marketing people back to the roots of marketing, which is about the people that we're trying to communicate with. Absolutely. I just saw a question come in around SMS and I want to make sure that we get to it at the end, but everything that you just shared applies to all the direct marketing channels that we have at our fingertips to create that communication. So those preference allow, allowing the, the, the customer and user to provide the preferences and email also applies to, to SMS, to direct mail, to push notifications and app. Those should all be collected to let the, the end user be the driver. Um, in combination, in my opinion, with some implicit data that we are able to collect, um, such as predictions that Laura spoke to earlier. Um, I'm going to move over to the next topic and, you know, the, the Apple stuff is great. And I, I foresee this being weaved into the topics that we have uh, to discuss. Uh, I'm going to segue into readiness. Laura, you mentioned um, preparation for with uh, discussions on the finance side and the data side, I, I, you have a, a wonderful background with two of the longest standing retail department stores, Macy's and Saks Fifth. And there's so many things to do within the wall of like marketing planning to ensure frictionless experiences for holiday. But I'm, I'm interested to know if marketers should be thinking beyond those walls uh, and their internal groups to best prepare. Uh, in your experience, what should marketing teams be asking their partners in IT and technology prior to the holiday? Yeah, that's that's a great question. It's not something that a lot of marketers tend to think of, marketers, excuse me, tend to think about. Um, but especially as we see such shifts in the marketing marketing calendar and the holidays are longer this year, sale periods are longer, you need to consider that there are impacts to your IT teams in terms of their load capacities. You're expanding. I know we had one question that was submitted um, where a company is expanding their sale days to 12 days from you know, a smaller number than last year. So have you let your IT teams know about that? Have you let your fulfillment centers know about that? Traditionally, they may have only been stocking up um, you know, uh, fulfillment center additional resources in November and December. Do they need to be doing that? You know, we're all already through September, but in October earlier this year, um, load capacities, have you really communicated what those high email sale days are going to be such that you're not going to have glitches or your website going down because we have this increased capacity? You know, we all know the high profile times that Target has done this, but the Good news for Target is that they have this brand equity that they've built up with their clients. I don't know their actual convert customer conversion cycle, but I have to imagine customers shop with them either once or, or every other week. Um, we don't really have that advantage for a lot of the smaller or mid-sized companies or for sub-verticals where people may only shop with you four times a year. So if that one interaction with you over holiday is when your website is down or your click-throughs on your emails aren't working, then you are going to lose that customer based on that. So it really does require um, that conversation, as well as we talk about the shifts in the KPIs, ensuring that all of those data points that you now want to capture as you start to think about transitioning your measurement, um, that you're actually capturing those in your data lakes and your data warehouses such that they are flowing through to your reporting. I mean, how annoying would it be? You get to mid-October and you realize, hey, I talked to my finance team and I said to them, I want to start to take a look at engaged sessions but you don't actually have that data beyond the you know, 24 hours. You haven't been capturing it for seven days or whatever period you want to. So think about all of those nuances um, as you go into this period and as we're seeing this change. I love that call out. And I, I think it, don't consider it uh, over communication and assume, assume nothing. I, I think that especially with like, you know, speaking to your, your team that's running the warehouse, they may not be intimately familiar with new changes and shifts that are happening specifically for this new holiday season that I, you know, I believe is starting earlier this year. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get to some of the current challenges, you know, macro and on a macroeconomic level are impacting supply chain and, and inventory and, and, and shipping times. But this is a crucial um, holiday period where marketing needs to really over communicate um, and relay their plans uh, to drive sales uh, this year. Um, would anyone like to chime in on, on that? Uh, great job, Laura. 
Yeah, I mean, no, I, I think you covered it. I think a lot of it is going to be a lot of open communication. And I think kind of crossing and getting rid of those silos and discussing with your IT teams and figuring out what you need to be doing to optimize. Um, this kind of ties into like our next segue, but what you're doing to optimize and make sure that every aspect of your marketing can handle the capacity that the not only the the height of sale time will bring, but also just to optimize your site, optimize any of your initiatives moving forward. I think it's critical um, to not work in those silos and to to keep everyone posted on what's happening all the time and when we can expect to see higher traffic days um, or more volume going in or out. I think we're good. All right. So I'll just take over because that's a perfect segue. I just segued myself. Um, that's a perfect segue into kind of our next topic, which is really discussing what, you know, optimizations that brands can be implementing to really increase and prepare, increase their engagement and prepare for the holiday shopping season. And I'll kind of pose it to Adamola first. Um, just what optimizations do you think are great to be using. I know there's a ton of different things you can be doing, not just for website, but across the board for your marketing strategy to ensure that you are engaging and making a seamless experience for consumers. Do you have an hour? Because I can talk about this for a while. <laughs> I wish, Adam, well, I wish you and I could talk about this for hours upon hours, but I, I think so. <laughs> no worries. I'll try and keep it as short as possible, but uh, I'll start with website optimization. So I think these are things that definitely need to be tested, but things that you can implement that are pretty reliable in terms of website optimizations are things like one-click upsells, right? So when a customer adds something to cart, you immediately send a prompt over to say, hey, this actually pairs really well with what you're about to buy. Do you want to add this to your cart? That converts pretty well, but I find one-click upsells on the post-purchase side of things convert even better. So for us specifically at Vagabond Cookies, um, we see about a 40% conversion rate when we ask people to add another six pack of cookies to their cart after they've already purchased. And that's pretty significant. It doesn't really cost us much more, but in terms of how much more money we make in terms of the AOV, it does have significant impact. Um, a few other sort of cool optimizations that I see is if you're selling bundles or you have gifts with purchases, that sort of thing, you can gamify your website in a way that says like in your cart, you can add a progress bar to say, hey, you're only $5 away from getting this prize or $10 away from free shipping. Um, that's another sort of optimization. And I'm speeding through these in my head just to make sure we have enough time. Uh, sticky add to carts, that's something that always works, but how effective it is, is dependent on your brand. And then I think one of the most important things that I've seen recently and has been more of a discussion is um, shipping uh, information on the product page, right? So many customers will go through your website to figure out what your shipping and return policies are. And you can just save them the trouble by adding something on your product page that speaks to that. Because what you don't want is someone to look for your shipping policies and then go, oh, that's cool. I'm not on a product page anymore and I'm gone. Like I have a phone call or something else that distracts them from actually making the purchase. So that's on the website optimization side of things. The other cool thing that I've been hearing a lot about recently that we've also implemented ourselves and we've been seeing a lot of success with are pre-sell pages. So essentially what this is, is when you are running paid ads, instead of sending traffic directly to your website, what you're doing is you're sending customers to a landing page that includes all of the necessary information that a customer would need in order to make an informed purchase. So it'll typically consist of like a really cool hero image, and then some social proof, what, what the benefits of your brand are. Um, and it's more of a conversation and it gives customers all the data that you think that they will require before they actually make the purchase. And then the only calls to action on that page are purchase calls to action. So add to cart or buy now. So if they click that, it'll take them directly to checkout. And uh, it basically makes the, the game a lot easier for them, right? And then in the event that they don't check out at that point, you can use retargeting ads to say, hey, you almost purchased this. Uh, why didn't you also, it's still available, right? Um, so I would say those are sort of the optimizations that we have in mind coming up for uh, the holidays. And then just to the earlier point of like extending Black Friday, Cyber Monday sales, if I heard correctly, um, I think one thing that we've been thinking about is 
making sure that we get people hyped up about the Black Friday, Cyber Monday sales coming up at least a month before. And that way it makes it less of a battle to struggle for acquiring these customers because obviously customer acquisition costs go way up during these periods. So if you can get to your customers first and say, hey, if you give us your email or phone number now, like we'll let you know what sales are going on and you'll be eligible for better sales. Uh, it makes the fight a lot less of a struggle in those Black Friday, Cyber Monday periods when you actually are trying to like compete with all these other brands that probably have a lot of money and will make your life difficult at those points in time. So that's what I would say about those things. Did yeah. I miss anything there? <laughs> I mean, we could talk about this all day, but you did cover a lot. And I think, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of optimizations you can do um, within the website and within other elements of your holiday marketing strategy. I think the pre-sale pages are a great way to do it. And I do think tying back to kind of realigning our KPIs, right? Leveraging a pre-sale page to kind of really hone in on specific sales during the holiday period will give us a better view of which sales are doing the best. How can we leverage those for next year? Um, you know, they, you're really directing people straight there and saying, can you check out? So you'll see it's really measuring a click directly to a specific element. And you could divide up some of your sales also. So you can see which ones did well and which ones to drop for next year. Um, the only other thing I'd say is really, you know, really taking a look at your personalization strategies and leveraging a lot of different ways to personalize all of your marketing ex executions. And a lot of things we've talked about or heard a lot about is, you know, leveraging automation for all this stuff. So leveraging dynamic creative optimization, which is basically just personalizing ads. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of uptick in the optimization and utilization of contextual kind of marketing in terms of email and advertising, um, as well as a lot of kinetic stuff, even though I think some of us are trying to get away from creating that web experience in the inbox. I think sometimes it does work depending on what it is, right? So I think we'll see a lot of changes uh, coming forward, but great things. Uh, Monica, Laura, do you have anything to add? I know we talked a lot. I'm so sorry. No, all good. These were all really, really great things. It, uh, actually, what Adamella said uh, gave me a, an idea or, or something that I found to be pretty successful uh, in regards to the extension of Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Um, Laura had mentioned profit as being like an, a very important metric, right? And I think often with our big sales and big moments, we, we go wide, we do blanket promotions. And sometimes, it especially on non-holiday periods, we, we tend to give away potentially unnecessary discount dollars. So I think specifically for these big moments of like Black Friday, Cyber Monday, there's an opportunity to use our tools and the data to identify high intent purchasers that did not purchase during these um, uh, these big moments, maybe their life got carried away. Maybe they got a text message while they were browsing and just forgot to come back or they found a better deal. You could identify who those people are that engaged, came to your site or clicked through the email, did not purchase, layering in things like their loyalty um, status or things like their previous AOV. You could create a specific promo or simply say exclusively for you, come back and shop the Black Friday promo or Cyber Monday promo. It may not be on the site, so it'll be very exclusive. You can do that very simply by pulling an audience of these users, layering in what additional criteria, refining it to those high intent purchases that you want to reward. And maybe it's a, a perk specifically for your, your top customers drive those conversion rates and create those positive experiences. You know, like we as marketers can do all, all we can to get that communication in there, but ultimately it, the timing needs to align for the customer to be able to make that purchasing decision and make it happen. So it may not always be aligned with when we are running these promotions. So I think uh, it only builds the relationship and exclusivity by using the data to create this experience to drive those Black Friday sales and Cyber Monday sales. So just another tip to for the extension piece. That's awesome. Yeah, that, Monica, I love that. Yeah. Um, and I think we kind of touched on some of the things we were already planning on touching on, um, but I think we'll kind of shift gears a little bit just to kind of talk, it's a good segue, but to talk about what kind of new channels and platforms and methodologies brands are really using. So I think we've seen here at Theorem and I'm sure everyone's seeing it across the board that 
omni-channel kind of strategies are booming right now, right? We're trying to reach customers in all different types of avenues, everywhere they kind of live, breathe. Um, and I know there's been a big uptick in terms of increase in video, live stream, leveraging influencers. And I think, you know, we're going to keep seeing that increase, but I think I'll kind of kick it over to Adam Mola to talk more about what are some other things that you're seeing in terms of uptick in um, platform and channel usage that people can use and maybe consider leveraging for their holiday marketing initiatives this season. Oh boy. Okay. I have to shorten this again. <laughs> um, let me think. I think we touched on SMS a bit earlier. Um, and I think that the main hesitation there is uh, brands feel like they're bothering customers, right? Um, but I think that the open rates there don't really lie. It's a 98% open rate on SMS. And you know, I feel like if you do SMS in the right way, then you can get some really great returns, right? So I often urge brands and say like, hey, if you're nervous about doing SMS, start with your top customers and then you know, see how they react to it and start like a slow rollout to other customers from there. Um, so I think SMS is a huge channel that is not being utilized um, very well right now. And I think there's opportunities to increase the adoption there. Uh, I, I won't say more about SMS there because I could go on, but the other, the other channel that I'm obsessed with is TikTok. And I feel like there are a few misconceptions around that social media channel. Uh, one of which being that, you know, it's only children and teenagers that use TikTok. And what we found is that 40% of TikTok users are actually over the age of 30. And half of those users make over 75K a year. So they have money and they're looking to spend. And I think TikTok is the perfect platform for that because it's very difficult to explain the culture on TikTok, but the way in which these influencers garner trust with their audience is just unparalleled in, in comparison to other social media platforms. So if you can find a way to leverage influencers to push your brand you know, in a user-generated con content kind of way, then people are much more likely to spend money on your product because they're buying it, they're getting trust from someone that they already trust, right? Um, so that's what I'd say about TikTok. The I'm other- having us on TikTok really quick. Yeah. I think the, yeah. the, the, the most interesting thing for me on TikTok is the, the content that's created in that channel is then used uh, across Instagram and Facebook and, and it is super valuable to drive the engagement in that channel, which I think, you know, historically we're a lot more comfortable how to navigate and use and leverage it to drive the revenue. Uh, but it's a beautiful thing to see, you know, wins on TikTok and how it's iterated and leveraged across other, other you know, marketing channels so that we know how to. I totally agree. It's a beautiful thing, TikTok. And which is why I feel the need to move on to the next thing before I talk about it too much. Pinterest, um, that's something that I actually haven't explored myself, but from what I've been reading, um, the cost for acquisitions are about half the cost of Facebook. Um, and I think that it's a severely underutilized channel as well. And I think it really depends on the industry that you're in, but pinners have a lot of money. <laughs> that's just the, the cold hard fact of it. 60% um, of their users are women and 50% of those users make over $100,000 a year. And they're actually on that platform to make purchases. So I think um, that's, some, that's where marketers are starting to turn their attention to, at least to my knowledge. Um, but those are some of the uh, channels that I'm looking at particularly. One thing that I wanted to say just about video, um, this is kind of difficult to scale, but something that we've found in our experience is that using video for customer service or like frequently asked questions or complaints, refunds, returns. Um, just having a human saying like, hey, we're sorry about what happened, um, you know, come back and we'll give you this. Or like just having that human element over video to say like, listen, we're not gonna send you a text email to say like, go to our claims department or like go to <laughs> go somewhere else. Like we're, we're shoving this issue on someone else. Um, in our case, we've seen that 90% of our customers actually come back and are repeat customers after we send them a personalized video. And if you can find a way to do that with your brand, then it just really does help with retention rates on that side. So 
I'll stop there just in case. Thank <laughs> you. That's actually a perfect segue. Uh, this is not as the, the exciting part of marketing, but indeed marketing's job to ensure that we're delivering positive customer experiences and being com good communicators. So I'm happy that you sort of landed on, you know, the customer service aspect of it. So given the continuation of pandemic induced buying surging and um, the fact that we're currently as a retail industry being faced with, you know, projected supply chain shortages and shipping delays. So um, I want to pivot to, you know, things that we should be prioritizing to create nimble and rewarding customer experiences as, you know, we as, as marketers and, and brands plan our holiday initiatives. So I, I want to, and um, I'll pivot to Talora to, to see, you know, I'd like to, I'd like you to share some things that marketers should be considering as these are indeed the, the immediate set of challenges that we need to face to ensure that, you know, we're maintaining positive customer experiences. Yeah, very true, Monica. I mean, for a lot of retail sub-verticals, we're projected double-digit supply chain shortages. So this is not a small issue. Um, so a couple things that I can recommend early in the season, focus on pre-orders. So anything you can do to try to get, especially those existing customers, we all know cost more money to get a new customer than it does to satisfy and engage um, your existing customers. So focus on with your existing customers who for most retailers actually tend to buy earlier in the season. Um, if you haven't done this analysis, please run this because this probably won't be true for every single person on this call. But for a lot of the companies that I've worked with, newer customers tend to purchase closer to the holiday, holiday and existing customers tend to purchase um, further out. And that's true of any holiday period, not just um, the ones that we're in right now. So focusing on those existing customers, offering um, pre-orders to them, and then offering alternative fulfillment solutions. So you don't have the product, what else can you give them? Something like an electronic gift card. Um, hey, I don't have that mixer that I really know you wanted to send to your mom, but what about if I send her January through June, the top six kitchen gadgets that I have are best-selling ones. So that gives you time to get that shortage the shortages in. And yes, it's not exactly what she picked, but it's something that's a bestseller that she might need. So, and it's something that will delight her over the course of six months versus just in December. So be creative with those fulfillment options. Um, prioritizing mobile, y'all, I know it's trite at this point. We hear this over and over again, but I cannot tell you um, how many people still aren't doing that. Have you gone through and clicked through your emails to make sure when you do that on a mobile site that it actually clicks through and the, your mobile enabled web, your app, et cetera, are all um, you know, working and functioning the way that they, they should. And then the last um, two things I would say is, okay, if you don't have the, the short, or excuse me, you don't have the supply in there that you want to be able to sell during this period, how can you still nurture and build that relationship with your consumer? Well, we all know sustainability, social values, environmental awareness, those are huge right now. They're forefront of consumers' minds. So what about organizing an event for them that says, hey, bring in all of your old beauty products and we'll recycle them for you and I'll give you a... $20 gift card to be able to use January 15th through February 15th, or focus on the fabrication, the sustainability in your fabrication model and send out emails around how you are helping our environment or your, your logistics, anything that you've worked on in that so that you're still connecting and nurturing with that um, consumer, even when you can't actually sell them something right now. And then lastly is clarity. So I just bought a house in the last year and it is shocking to me how many retailers have not figured out that if you're going to miss a ship date, you have to let me know. Mm -hmm. So go through, do run an audit of your emails, make a purchase yourself and see what it's like. If you miss a ship date, the customer should not be coming to you to say, where's my product? You should be notifying them and then make good on that. How are you going to fulfill the fact that you're you know, not answering their expectations? What can you offer them? It's not always a, a discount. It can be something else. Talk to the customer. Um, I love what Ed Amola was saying earlier. Sometimes it's about customer service and just listening. So figure out what that is um, such that you have clarity Clarity, you have a process in place and you're meeting those expectations. Oh, those are all really, really great points. Um, so automation is a, is a way to ensure that you do that, right? If, the, yeah. if an order hasn't been processed and shipped, you can trigger an email that says, 
you know, sorry, your order is late. It could include make good, whatever that communication may be. It's there. Um, another, if that is not an option and you maybe don't have the access to, um, your transactional emails, the way you do your marketing emails. Another way to do it is if you are, if you're for some reason in a situation where your warehouse is backlogged, put a dynamic, including your order confirmation email. That way it, it's sort of there and the customer has some visibility into some delays. Or if there is an issue with inclement weather, that that's somehow relayed in, in those existing emails. Um, if creating new communication is not there and any little bit of information is really valuable to the customer, especially, um, and, and to set expectation with them. On the fun side of it, I do want to build on the, the gift card component of it. I think this is the year where, because of these challenges, marketers can make it fun. And I, I, I think this is also the year to work in e-gift card into um, your promotional strategies. I think restaurants do this really well. If you buy a gift card, you get a $10 gift card for yourself. Um, I know that when I personally shop for, for holiday gifts, I'm also shopping for myself. So how do you um, not only... Um, so, you know, fulfill the, the need of, of a customer buying for others, but get them to come back and purchase for themselves uh, and drive that repeat purchase if they're an existing customer, working it into your promotional strategy. And this also delivers the product right away, cuts a lot of overhead with, you know, with shipping um, and maybe a little bit more profitable and, and you know, I'm sure your customer service team will thank you and your warehouse will thank you in regards to, to volume. So I think this is definitely the, the moment in time to make it fun. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll help all of you. Um, I'm going to segue. Um, I know we touched a little bit on reporting, but I think this year specifically, um, it's, it's going to be different. Last year, 2020 was not apples to apples to 2019. And this year, 2021 is not going to be apples to apples to 2020. It's uh, it's a little bit of Frankensteining, and we we have what we have. But um, I want to ask Laura, you know, how do you think holiday is going to be compared to last year and the year prior, and what tips do you have to the marketers dialed in today? Uh, I know you mentioned uh, benchmarking, but what else would you say is important? Yeah, I mean, this isn't unlike 2007, 2008. I was at Saks um, around that time, and literally for three years, we used 10, 2007 as our benchmark period after that, um, because if you tried to benchmark against 2008, you wouldn't have continued being a solvent business. So um, consider that maybe 2019 for some businesses is the right year to use as your comparison benchmark versus 2020. Um, shifts in marketing calendars, we're seeing that a lot. So that's going to cause it to be difficult to measure. Maybe this year you're having an event in October, which last year was in November. That's not an apple to apple comparison. Three days versus eight days. Again, the same thing. The good news is benchmarking is important, baselines are important, but we also have real-time measurement nowadays. You should be re measuring at the micro level, and when I say micro, I mean campaign, strategy, whatever it is, you should be measuring that stuff in real time. At the macro level, especially in a time like right now, um, when everything is shifting, that's when we really talk about those three big KPIs that I mentioned earlier, profit, customer satisfaction, brand equity. Those are the ones that you can compare to your benchmarks and your baselines very well. How did you do overall? How are you performing on a revenue versus cost basis, et cetera? But when you come down, I really encourage that segmentation, that experimentation, and that real-time measurement um, and trusting in that more than you have kind of historically um, done because we have that capability and because that's what's required. Frankenstein is exactly um, a good word for measurement right now. Um, Laura, I'm going to skip to a question specifically on reporting that um, that came in. Um, it's around the Apple iOS updates and, um, you know, the person that submitted the question said they use opens to help attribute in-store sales. So mm -hmm. how do you how would you recommend the pivot on an attribution level for um, email performance and attribu attribution to in-store revenue? Oh, that's going to be tough. Um, I mean, I would say there's a couple of things. First of all, you're not losing all of your open. So that's the good news. I, I don't know which retailer this is, but again, you can take that if let's just say you're at 70% of your opens now, whereas it used to be at 100 
prior to this going into place, um, you can take that and decrement it and still end your sales. Same thing. You would want to still understand that relationship and, and decrement it by that same amount so that you still have the associated correlation to understand, okay, is this driving X percent, even though you'll have to then scale it up to understand how much of the revenue is then associated to that. Um, other aspects of that or are, I don't know that opens actually correlate to them. I assume you've run that correlation analysis, but if you haven't, then try some correlation analysis to see, is it opens, is it clicks, is it engaged sessions after? What are those consumer behaviors that are actually leading to that purchase behavior? Maybe it's people that open it and then have an engaged session for, you know, over two minutes or visit three or more web pages. Um, and that will help you because you can still get that information afterwards. Maybe it's people who open and then sign up um, or only who click through. So if you haven't run that correlation analysis against those lower level of segmentations, I would do that to really understand what are those leading indicators of your in-store um, revenue. So both of those things. Thanks for the uh, quick pivot and great response to that very challenging question of attribution. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so we have come to the Q&A portion of um, today's event. And um, I know that there's been so many great questions coming in through the chat. So I'm excited to, to dive in. So I will go into it. I know that um, Adamala you mentioned wanting to talk about SMS all day. So here is your opportunity. Um, so the question is, any thoughts on a shift to SMS messaging? I'm seeing a lot more in my personal life. My leadership team feels it would be a bother slash and made customers, even though they would have to opt in. Ooh, yes. So I feel like that's the general sort of sense around SMS messaging. Like it's an invasion of personal space. Um, but I think as long as you get customers to opt in the right way, you should be okay. So like a couple of strategies that we use that we found are pretty effective and non-invasive, um, are like double opt-in pop-ups for instance, right? So you, a customer wants a, uh, an, an offer, like an entrance offer on your site. So that comes up, it says, Hey, enter your email if you want 10% off. And then it shows like a progress bar on the top that lets the customer know that that's not all the information that you need. And then it'll say something like enter in your phone number to complete and get your discount, right? And if customers drop off at that point, then they really don't want you having their phone number. But if they do put their phone number in, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> if they do put their phone number in, then you should be okay. And they always have the option to opt out. So. I think the nervousness is around like unsolicited SMS and that's something that you should completely shift away from. But as long as you're getting the customer's consent to message them, you may see a high drop off after the uh, discount has been applied to their order, but it's a good start, I would say. You're gonna find customers that are interested in, in that at some point. Totally agree. And I, I think it's worth saying that uh, email and SMS strategies differ in that you know, SMS is, is right on the phone. It can be invasive as, you know, as it was called out, if it were a one-to-one -one execution to email, mm -hmm. like sending an SMS for every email you sent would automatically, I would opt out of it. Um, so really identifying those moments that matter. And I think starting with things like transactional messages, the customer wants to know when their order has delivered, when it has uh, been shipped, um, maybe they want to know specifically when an item is back in stock, mm -hmm. send me a text message versus sending me an email. Um, also there, you know, I, I know we touched lightly on the importance of gathering that zero party data from the customer, but, you know, maybe creating a, a preference center where the customer can say, like, send me only text messages about new arrivals or only when, when you run a, a, a sale and putting it in their hands, uh, so that, it's the moments that really matter to the customer um, in regards to SMS and that will help navigate through um, the fear and apprehensiveness of, of really building out a uh, what may be perceived by leadership team that may not be as familiar with the channel and its power um, to proceed. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, and if you don't mind me adding one quick thing to that too, I think transparency is key. I think that's been the theme of today's chat. So if you can just say to customers, hey, we gave you your discount, this is what we're going to be following up with in terms of messaging. 
do you want to see that or not? Right. And then maybe checking in every couple of months to say, hey, how are things going? Do you still want to receive these? And then that'll just give you an idea of like who's actually invested and who's not. So that's another suggestion I would have there. Absolutely. And while we're still on mobile, Laura, we have a question for you. Um, you mentioned mobile earlier. What type of metrics should we expect from mobile advertising and in-app campaigns? What is re a realistic expectation for driving foot traffic and conversion from mobile ads? So, sorry, I didn't exactly understand. Are we looking for the list of metrics or are we looking for baseline numbers? Um, I think it's the, the metrics that we should be paying attention to. Okay, because um, so what's interesting with apps is just like we're talking about iOS 15, iOS 14.5 um, was a big rollout earlier this year and that had lots of ramifications in terms of the app metrics that you see out there and your capabilities, which is I, I assume kind of why we're um, talking about this. So there are shifts that, are, that have gone on in terms of that, um, ads personalization, performance reporting, um, app and web conversion events. Um, same thing that goes on here as we were just talking about, when, when I talk about measurement, I don't talk about it in the context of one channel, the concepts are, apply to any channel across the board, um, is that you need to really understand with your app, is it the download of the app that leads to conversions eventually? Is it um, reading of, you know, engagement time spent on the app that leads to it? Is it using a subscription model versus an ad model? Um, is it the type of phone that's being used? Because obviously we know there are differences in your capabilities there. Is it um, any sort of uh, additional things that you might offer such as RFIDs or, or QR codes to enable user understanding when they're in a physical store? All of those things can eventually correlate with a purchase behavior. So it really depends on, and I hate to just say that there's there's no metric because I, I don't even know what business this is, but it depends on the size of your business, what your app is meant to do. Is it primarily a purchase? Is it primarily discover? Is it both? Is it content? Um, what are you meant to be using that app for? When I go to the Target app, I am usually in discovery mode and purchase mode, Okay, but I'm not going to be reading a lot. Um, I'm just trying to discover what are all the products out there. That's different than when I go to some of the other apps that I'll use out there. So um, Instacart, whatever it is, they're, they're different uses for them. So you really want to understand what's the primary goal of your app um, and then what are you trying to achieve out of those behaviors? Fair point. Uh, Jennifer, I'm going to ask you this because I think you have a frontline um, point of view based on the, the clients that you support at Theorem. So the question is, I'm sort of curious what you think in terms of Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Are they still big or is this a trend that sales aren't going to be tied uh, as much directly to those dates? Yeah, so I think I think we're still seeing that they're big, right? I don't think they're going anywhere. They're kind of staples within the holiday marketing season. I think what we are seeing, and I know we mentioned this earlier, is that they are happening earlier. And I think there's a lot of things going on with a ton of different uh, retailers and um, EDC brands where they're offering pre-sales on exclusive things. So people are kind of leveraging different channels, including SMS, to really say, like, hey, here's an exclusive pre-sale for you before our Black Friday or our Cyber Monday sale. I think we're going to see a lot of that. I think we're going to see a lot of um, Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales kind of carry over. So there'll be like post-sale kind of discounts. And I think we'll see a lot of things tie into, um, you know, more personalization when it comes to promo codes and sales. Just really, I think a lot of it is shifting to it's gone digital now where it's not Black Friday is no longer where we all get up at four o'clock in the morning and we go like bombard each other into the mall to try to like steal, get a TV for like $10, right? It's not that anymore. It's really, we have everything at our fingertips all the time. So it's what can we offer to our consumers that speaks to them? And it's something that it's more exclusive than any other sale that they would get throughout the year. So I think you have to kind of hype it up. You have to start talking about it early. And I need, think you need to give them um, more, we're seeing clients give more discounts and more promotional stuff for loyalty, really rewarding that for clients. So I think a lot of it is about appealing to the consumer, giving them what they need, um, and listening, right? We're kind of trying to put things back into their hands and really giving them more control. So 
um, showing value is really, really critical as well. So it's not going anywhere. Everyone's still doing it. Um, and we're still sending out a ton of emails. I just think the way we go about it um, and the way that consumers actually react to it is a little bit different. Completely agree. Um, so I know that Adamala uh, shared, uh, or someone touched on wallet share earlier, and it made me think, if holidays starting earlier, how do you capture wallet share of your customers sooner? Um, obviously, Black Friday and Cyber Monday are, are big moments, right? They're not going to go anywhere. However, do you need to open up your holiday? It may be an opportunity to think about opening up your holidays, period, with a front-loaded big moment, allow for smaller uh, promotions leading up to the big events so that there isn't a, what I call promo fatigue, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's a lot of work that goes behind your promotion strategy and execution. And if you don't have that big moment in, um, in those specific Black Friday, Cyber Monday periods, you may not have that big bang. So how do you strategically place those big moments to capture that wallet share ahead of time. It may be something to consider now versus saving it all for um, uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and, and, and thinking about like, what do you have in between? Um, and how does that impact your audience? So it, 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 as you said, Jennifer, requires a lot of listening and, and monitoring. And as Laura pointed out, looking at the data, it is an art and a science for sure. And Monica, I would add on that, if you are a retailer that's in one of those businesses that's projected to have giant supply chain issues, you know, footwear, Christmas trees, et cetera, please do exactly what Monica was saying early in the season, have your own specific sales because all consumers, I think, are aware of this. I mean, we're in the business, we talk about it, but everyone around me is talking about that too. And so athletic apparel, et cetera. So try and focus on being able to push out your goods early. Wonderful. Um, I know we're running up on a two minute mark. I, I want to ask one thing. Um, it may be a little bit of a loaded question, but I'm going to try and fit it in. Should brands, and we started with the Apple Mail privacy, but should brands be rethinking their user authentication strategy, uh, uh, including email collection? So, so the person that uh, sent in the question said that they are thinking about Apple, Facebook, Google authenticated logins. Does anyone on the panel have thoughts on that? I mean, I would say everyone needs to be rethinking that in general, especially, I mean, hide my email is a new feature that came out with 15. It's paid for versus free. So we're going to see a lower adoption rate of that, but you're still going to see adoption rate of that. So you need to consider what, um, not only what data you're collecting, but also how you're connecting that going forward. So if you used email as your primary connection point going forward, well, what else can you do in combination with that? And maybe what else do you need to collect exactly to what Adam Mola was saying earlier about phone number, you might need phone number going forward. It might need to be some combination of phone number, first name, last name, plus email um, or thereabouts. As far as the authentication, I think that's a personal choice um, by your business and how you want to run that and the relationship that you have. Obviously, we know a lot of these um, changes, 14.515, are impacting Facebook in big ways, just so much the same way that they are, um, you know, a lot of other channels. So, and in terms of privacy and trust and establishing that clarity and communication with the consumer, how do you want as a business to have that and build that trust relationship with your customer? That question has to be asked. Is that authentication something that you want to own as part of your um, policy? Perfect little wrap up with a bow. Thank you, Laura, Jennifer, and Adam all for your valuable insights. I do want to go to the next slide. There are a ton more of ideas around strategies and tactics uh, this holiday. Uh, Sail through and Theorem both have um, are producing guides specifically to help retail marketers through this season. Uh, I encourage you to download the Sale Throughs uh, Smart Marketers Guide to Holiday 2021 Success. Uh, lots of ideas that I touched on and so, so much more, especially through the lens of the Apple Mail Privacy Updates and, and Theorem. 
uh, is, so is working on a, a guide for marketing success this holiday season. Uh, we will follow up with an email. So be on the lookout for that. And, and I hope that everyone that attended today's event um, is, is off to a great start with holiday planning. If you're interested in learning more about sale through or theorem, uh, the information is on this slide. Um, you can find any of the panel members on LinkedIn as well. Feel free to connect. Uh, and I thank you all for your time. Have a wonderful rest of your week.